Okay, shalom everybody. It's December the 28th. We're talking about Parshat Vayichi. This, this week's Parsha is Vayichi. It's the last Parsha in the book of Breshit. We've done a tremendous amount of work on our journey from Breshit to this point. And um, I think it's not an accident that uh, the Torah, at least the book of Breshit, ends on, this, uh, on, on a moment, the moment of death and burial. Uh, where Joseph is buried in a coffin in Egypt. Uh, many people have commented that, you know, the book of Reshit starts out with the expanse of creation. It's the universe. And then um, it ends with uh, Joseph in a coffin, which is as far um, opposite to the expanse of the universe as you can imagine, at least in, in biblical terms. Um, <coughs> I don't think it's a happy ending. I think it's a sad ending. I think uh, based on uh, my comments last week and my comments uh, over Shabbat, I think uh, Joseph is a mixed blessing for the people of Israel. And what I'm gonna show uh, today is that I think he thinks that, um, well, I let, let's, let's leave off what, what he thinks. Let's see what you think of what he thinks, okay? And with that, I'm going to go to the text here, and we will, uh, here's the, the sheet that I've uh, produced here. This is death and burial, and uh, or contempt of Egypt. That's what, what I think he thinks, okay? So the, the Parsha begins with Vayechi Yaakov Be'eretz Mitzrayim. Jacob lived 17 years in the land of Egypt. So the span of Jacob's life came to 147 years. And when the time approached for Israel to die, he summoned his son, Joseph, and said to him, do me this favor. Place your hand under my thigh as a pledge of your steadfast loyalty. Please do not bury me in Egypt. When I lie down with my fathers, take me up from Egypt and bury me in their burial place. So it's, that's the formula of covenant or of agreement. It's the, you know, we won't go into that. Do righteousness and truth. I'm not going to go into that phrase either, but that chesed ve'emet or chesed shel becomes the, the phrase associated with what to do when someone dies, acting ca- compassionately. Alna tikbereini b'mitzrayim. So he is making a, a specific request. Do not bury me in Egypt. The shechafti avotai. I want to sleep with my fathers. Unesatani b'mitzrayim. Therefore, I want you to take me up from Egypt, and Joseph says, and then Jacob, and this, we have to get a little bit of a smile because Jacob is Jacob. And he shavali, swear to me, and he swore to him, and Israel bowed at the end of the bed. There, there are lots of different um, notes I can make on this. Which, uh, I always like to point out the fact that Jacob is 147 years old. 147 is seven squared times three, uh, 49 times three. The ages of the patriarch follow uh, a a kind of interesting progression. Five squared times seven, six squares times five, and seven squared times three. Five squared times seven, that's 175. Age of Abraham, six squared times um, five is 36 times five. That's the age of Isaac, 180. And seven squared times three is 147. That's the age of Isaac. Very interesting and very compelling uh, pattern there. Uh, yes, not compelling. I'm sorry. Not compelling. Not compelling. <laughs> Ascending squares and descending odds. It's not, do you, do you find it not compelling? It's Compelling to me in the sense of symbolic language in which the, the, the narrator of this text is trying to present 
the ages in an ordered world. That to me is a compelling statement, but uh, 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 okay, if you think that's random, you're entitled to that opinion. Okay. Uh, is it the same time that uh, Yosef lived in Knan? They both, uh, Yosef was 17 mm -hmm. when he left uh, Knan. Yes. And Jacob lived in Egypt. Uh, 17 years. Also so, important no. that, that Jake Joseph is 17 years old when he's brought down yes. to Egypt and that he lives in Egypt. I'm right in the middle of a class. You can come in and take it with okay. me. It's the rabbi's to... class. Uh, okay, I'm taking this class online. I'm sorry. I, you can I... stop in. And... Okay, so the, the um, 17 years of Joseph is alive. And then at the end of his life, 70 years, it's not an accident. That, that is um, uh, uh, the, the, the way the Torah brackets Jacob's life, that, that he has Joseph for 17 years and then at the end, 17 years. That, that itself is not a coincidence either. Okay. Well, what I find interesting here uh, on this go round is that uh, Jacob makes reference to uh, the land of Egypt by name. Uh, Jacob will will refer to Egypt um, by uh, you know that this is Egypt. Okay, uh, don't bury me in Egypt. Take me up from Egypt. Ukvartani bury me in their bed. Okay, so now we're going to go to the 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 point where where he dies. Okay. Um, and uh, he says as follows. When Jacob finished his instructions to his sons, don't we have a few scenes before this, one scene before that is the blessing of Menashe and Ephraim. I'm, I'm skipping over that. The second scene is the blessing <coughs> of, the, of the 12 sons. I'm skipping over that. And so it's at the end of that blessing, chapter 49, verse 33, that, that it says as follows. When Jacob finished his instructions to his sons, he drew his feet into the bed, and breathing his last, he was gathered to his people. And and here, I, you know, we often like to comment: Would that you have a death like this, where you say what you need to say, and you know when you're going to die, and that's it. They 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 put your they put you back in bed. They sit you. They lie you down, and it's over. Right? You know. I don't want to be too, too jocular about it because obviously we, we've been all around the, these very difficult scenes, but if, you, you know, if there's a way to go, that's the way to go, okay? And, and we don't need to be too dramatic about it. It's a very aesthetic uh, form of death. And, and I know many, many of my colleagues, we've all preached a, a sermon or two on you know, the, the question of how, how it is that we die today, we die you know, at home, uh, in hospitals rather than at home, et cetera, et cetera. I don't want to go into that. That is, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a depressing topic. But what happens upon the, that moment is, is fascinating. It's just, it's just fascinating from the, the sense of the story and then again from the idea of death and burial and specifically the burial in the land of Israel. What Vayichi, what this Parsha is trying to tell us really in, 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 the, in the narrative form is that Jacob will not remain interred in the land of Egypt. He has to go up. Joseph, on the other hand, has a problem. And Joseph's problem is that he has this role to play for Pharaoh. So let's read what's going on here. Uh, I'll make it a little bigger in the, in the, on the screen. Joseph flung himself upon his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. And Joseph ordered his, the physicians in his service to embalm his father. And the physicians embalmed Israel. It required 40 days for such as the full period of embalming. The Egyptians bewailed him 70 days. And when the wailing period was over, Joseph spoke to Pharaoh's court saying, do me this favor and lay this appeal before Pharaoh. My father made me swear saying, I'm about to die. Be sure to bury me in the grave 
I'm made ready for myself in the land of Canaan. Now, therefore, let me go up and bury my father, and then I shall return. And Pharaoh said, go up and bury your father, as he made your promise on oath. So Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him went up all the officials of Pharaoh, the senior members of his court, and all of Egyptians, Egypt's dignitaries, together with all of Joseph's household, his brothers, and his father's household. Only their children, their flocks, and their herds were left in the region of Goshen. Chariots, too, and horsemen went up with him. It was a very large troop. When they came to Goran Atad, which is beyond the Jordan, they held a very great and solemn lamentation, and he observed a mourning period of seven days for his father. When the Canaanite inhabitants of the land saw the mourning at Goran Atad, they said, this is a solemn mourning on the part of the Egyptians. That is why it was named Evel Mitzrayim, which is beyond the Jordan. Thus, his sons did for him and as he had instructed them. His sons carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah, the field near Mamre, which Abraham had bought for burial from Ephron the Hittite. After burying his father, Joseph returned to Egypt, he and his brothers, and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead. They said, what if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrong that, he did to, that we did him? So they sent this message to Joseph. Before his death, your father left the instruction. So shall you say to Joseph, forgive, I urge you, the offense and guilt of your brothers who treated you so harshly. Therefore, please forgive you the offense of, of your servants of the, of the God of your father. And Joseph was in tears as they spoke to him. His brothers went to him themselves, flung themselves before him and said, we are prepared to be your slaves. But Joseph said to them, have no fear. Am I a substitute for God? Besides, although you intended me harm, God intended it for good, so as to bring about the present result, the survival of many people. And so fear not, I will sustain you and your children. Thus he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. So Joseph and his father's household remained in Egypt. Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph lived to see children of the third generation of Ephraim. The children of Machir, son of Menasheh, were likewise born upon Joseph's knees. At length, Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die. God will surely take notice of you and bring you up from this land to the land that he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob. So Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, when God has taken notice of you, you shall carry up my bones from this. Joseph died at the age of 110 years, and he was embalmed and placed in a coffin in Egypt. And that is the end of the story. Boom. Hazak, hazak, v'nit chazek. All right, look, uh, there, there's just so, so much to talk about in this, in this passage here. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, for the sake of the theme that I want to um, highlight, I'm going to be selective on, on the text here. Okay, so first, uh, there's the death scene. He kissed him, he weeps over him. And then there is embalming. Why embalming? The rabbis at length take, take up the embalming issue, uh, whether or not it's, it's to, to, uh, to ask him to, uh, it's for the sake of protection or for the sake of, um, uh, you know, fulfilling what, what he has promised him. Uh, embalming itself, you know, this is, what Egyptian culture is all about. So it's very interesting from a lot of perspectives how Egypt and Egyptian culture seeps into the Bible here. We won't go deeply into that. But, so it's 40 days and by some scholarly assessments, that's how, how long it took to, to do a full embalming. 40 days, sorry, they, it, it took 40 days yeah. And then 70 days of mourning. So that, that's two, you know, 40 plus 70, that's 110 days. That's, that's three, four months of, of mourning, okay? It's a long time to keep someone around. Um, the wailing period of order, so, so you get the sense that in that, you know, 110 days, 90 days, three months and, and 20 days, Joseph doesn't really know what to do 
in terms of how to fulfill his oath. He made an oath and Jacob made Joseph swear. And I, I mentioned that with a kind of wry smile because Jacob is always about suspicion and guarantee. And even for his beloved son, he, he, he exacts, ex extracts an oath from him in order to, to make sure that he will do what he wants. That is how important burial in Israel is, in the land of Israel. Notice that when Joseph appeals, petitions Pharaoh, he says as follows. Uh, Joseph spoke to Pharaoh's court. It's not a direct appeal. It's, it's an appeal through intermediaries. That itself says something. That says, it's, you know, one, my interpretation of this would be that he's afraid to make the direct appeal to Pharaoh. And the reason he's afraid to make the direct appeal is because he is, he is an at-will servant to Pharaoh, and he's got to watch it. He's got to be very, very careful about his position. Notwithstanding the fact that he's very, very powerful, we all know that Pharaoh could eliminate him uh, at, uh, at a moment's notice, without a moment's notice even. So he's got to be very careful and very diplomatic in the way he makes a petition to Pharaoh because Pharaoh is dependent on him. And, and this means that my chief of staff, my vizier, my next in command is going to be out of commission for a certain period of time and that is very precarious, okay? Don't forget, they're in a famine. They're in a very, very difficult, um, well, is the famine, the famine is over, I think, at this point. All right. Uh, my father made me swear, saying, I am about to die. Be sure to be, bury me in the grave, which I made ready for myself in the land of Canaan. That's not what he said, by the way. He's, he's, he's not quoting him verbatim. He said, and I have the text here, do not bury me in Egypt. And what is Joseph saying? I let me be in my with my fathers. Take me out of Egypt. Don't bury me in Egypt. Take me out of Egypt. Let me bury with my fathers. Let me bury in my, with them. So he says, I am about to die. Be sure to bury me in the grave I made ready for myself in the Canaan. Okay. He doesn't say, don't bury me in Egypt. He says, don't uh, bury me in Canaan. He phrases it in the positive. Why? Why? Very simply. In this skillful diplomacy to Pharaoh, he's got to be very careful about his words. He can't denigrate Egypt. To say, don't bury me in Egypt, even when he names the country, is a way of saying, uh, as we all would like to say, feh. <laughs> right? This is, I, I, I love quoting my late grandmother a lot. My mother is here. It's a way of saying fe, right? Don't bury me in Egypt is a polite way of saying fe. At least he names Egypt, okay? But now in rephrasing this to Pharaoh, he says, bury me in Canaan, bury me in my father. Anyone can understand that you want to go back to your family. But if you say, don't bury me in Egypt, you're insulting Egypt. Well, and, and, and I, 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 okay, go ahead, Marlene, go ahead. Is that why we say when you're being sworn into something, you uh, say the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Well, it's supposed to just tell me the truth because there are 48 states in the United States is a true statement. It's just not the whole truth. So he <laughs> just told part of the truth because his father said, well, you know, bury me with them. Absolutely. I, you know, but I, I do think that there's just a little, I'm giving a little more piquant flavor to this, which is that, that in the way we talk and, 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 you know, we notice this all the time, you know, with, with in diplomacy, diplomacy is a highly coded way of speaking to people. You know, when you, when you are reading diplomatic messages between governments, you, you understand in what is said and what is not said. And, 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 and here um, we, we have this. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't see the, the whole people here. Go ahead. We got Steve. Go ahead. Uh, Joseph is very political, as you've been saying. Yes. 
So the fact that he, he says that Isaac prepared his own grave Jacob. is akin to Pharaoh but building his own tomb in the pyramids. Very nice. That's a lovely, lovely As soon as they became a king, they started building their own tombs. So that relates right away to uh, Egyptian practice. Very nice. Nice, nice insight. So, so, so that would kind of tip, tip the Egyptian pharaoh in his favor, saying, look, you have your, you have your pyramids here. We got our you know, caves <laughs> in, in Canaan. You understand. Do you understand? I want to go back with my, my ancestors, don't you? And that's that. And that's, but, but, but Joseph is very skillful in communicating that to Pharaoh. He says, rather than say, don't bury me in Egypt, he's saying, bury me in Canaan with my ancestors. That's my, my, my point. Okay, Ruth. Uh, it's not an error of commission. It's an error of omission. And it's not the first time it's happened in Brashi. When, uh, when they foretold, when um, the, the birth of Yitzchak was foretold, and Sarah laughed that Abraham can't have, you know, it was too old to have a son. Um, when God repeated the story, he left that part out. So he didn't lie. He just left that part out. Um, right. so, so and it's that, that kind of thing. Absolutely. Lots of different examples of, of this uh, kind of communication. Okay. And, and I have another question. Um, when the Egyptians uh, mourned him for 70 days and you added that on to the 40 days, but when somebody dies, wouldn't you just start mourning immediately? Like couldn't the 70 days have overlapped with the 40 days? Okay. Why would they have so, to wait till the embalming? I, I agree with you. I think there may be in fact, two different ways to view that text. One is a total period of 70 days rather than a period of 120 days that they were con you know, concurrent, right? So it's the 40 day embalming uh, is concurrent with the 70 day mourning period. That, that to me is also a plausible reading. The, the reason why I went for 40 days, then 70 days, A, is because it says that's the, seems to be the text. And, and, and I, I, I'm inclined to this idea that once the body is ready, that's when you start. Okay, and and that there is a this limbo period. I mean, we 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 today, you know, have this um, the practice of of course burial as quickly as possible, for the very reason that you don't start your formal your formal mourning until until burial. Okay, so because you're in limbo, uh, so I mean, and and you know, I know that that that. You know these are very difficult uh, issues, but but you know many people have had experiences where there have been deaths under you know questionable circumstances, where there has to be a suspension of the burial until uh, you know post mortem autopsy etc., or you know the transportation of of the body. You know we've had situations of people dying in Florida, people dying, you know, all over the country where you have to transport them. and nothing can really start until, until the burial that, that that's for sure. So, so uh, the, these things speak to a different kind of, or, or, or a reality that, that in a sense we can still relate to because you have to have the, 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 um, the new, the new thing there. Okay. So um, we have uh, uh this this presentation before Pharaoh, and we have uh, this the idea that the mourning is a complicated a complicated uh, set of, of stages that will happen. Okay, Rabbi, yes, isn't ahead. it isn't it strange that the Egyptians uh, mourn for seventy days? That it says the Egyptians. It, it is strange that the Egyptians more and and so w w to to you know ask what what's that about? It may mean that the Egyptians are participating and sharing in the life of Joseph. That Joseph was a beloved leader for the Egyptians, and that um, you know they 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 were experiencing that this with him, or that they observed the national period of mourning alongside Joseph for that period of time. You know, we, we to this day have those kinds of, of national periods of mourning, you know, a, a, a death of a leader, death of a president, death of a, a, a 
you know, any outstanding figure or, or national calamities, you know, call for a quote, national period of mourning during which um, the symbols of mourning are, are present uh, throughout the country. Um, so the flags are at half staff, I think for a period of 30 days. Um, and, uh, you know, the flag goes half at the, at the you know, on, on different monuments. That's for, that's, uh, uh, you know, just part of the, the, the life of a community, a life of a nation. Okay. So let me, let me bring back our sheet here. And uh, um, so, so they, they, there is a huge procession up to Egypt. Uh, Pharaoh, Pharaoh has replied to Joseph, go up and bury your father as he made you promise. So I've always taken the, the, the idea that this, this is a, he's a nice Pharaoh, he's a good Pharaoh, but he's a shrewd Pharaoh. And his policy with Joseph has been consistent from day one, which is, I need this guy, I need him happy, I will do anything that I, will, I can do to keep him happy, but he is going to be completely devoted to me. All right, so, and that is how I read Pharaoh, Pharaoh's answer to him, go up and bury your father. Verse seven, so Joseph went up to bury his father and with him went up all the officials of Pharaoh, the senior members of the court and all of Egyptians here. The, so it's, Vayal Yosef likbor vayalu ito kol avdei Pharaoh ziknei veito v'chol ziknei Eretz Mitzrayim. So this would be the equivalent of sending the Congress, the Senate, the the judges of the Supreme Court, and and anybody who's anybody within society. That is huge. I I, I read verse seven as, as with 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 kind of you know complete and total, not puzzlement, because I think the answer is fairly clear. Why would he do this? Why would, and, and by the way, Pharaoh's not going himself. Pharaoh's sending the entire government of Egypt, all of Egypt and its dignitaries up to Canaan. Why? Why do you think, he, why do you think he's doing that? Go ahead, Susie. Well, there's a couple of things. He wants to, he wants to, to, as you said, he wants to keep Joseph happy. So he wants to give him honor in sending an entourage with him. He also wants to make sure he comes back. There you go. So it's, it's, it's classic. It's a classic move. It's, I'm, I'm, I'm demonstrating through this gesture, a, a gargantuan gesture over the top that you, you know, we honor you, but I'm making sure that you're going to get back here. Okay. Because there is no way, there is no way that you're going to, you know, stand at the cave of Machpelah while you put your father in the cave and say, I, I think I want to stay. <laughs> I think I'd like to stay. I can tell you have to unmute. Go ahead. We know from the next sentence that he left his children and his flocks there. I mean, that was also a guarantee that he would come back. Okay. So, so he was putting double guarantees on. He really didn't trust him at all. So, so th this is our point of tension. This is the exact, exact, the exact, exact issue. The exact issue is that 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 what is his place within this society? Where does he belong? And and where is the level of trust? It's, there's always going to be a sense of, of distrust and conflict with the two of them, okay? Even, even, Yaakov, even Yaakov didn't fully uh, trust Yosef. And even Yaakov didn't fully trust him. That's correct. That is correct. Because Yosef said that, that he would bring him back to Canaan for burial, and, and then Yaakov came back and said, swear that you'll swear. do it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right. So that's verse 7. Then... Together with all of Joseph's household, his brothers and father's house, only their children, their flocks, as you correctly stated, tell, and their herds were left in the region. So he, he's got no family, and he's got his possessions, so he's got to come back. Chariots, two horsemen went up with them, very large troops. So very, very impressive. Okay, when it came, and then they make a whole, a whole big funeral outside of the of Jordan, 
a big solemn lamentation and the can you know and and so you get the idea here that pharaoh is making a huge diplomatic uh, scene because he's also indicating to the canaanites you know i'm egypt this is egypt you know and this is how we do things we do things in egypt we do it we do them big <laughs> we do things big bigly okay we're a superpower okay and that is why they named it of him Israel. thus his sons did for them as he had instructed them so again reading closely you know it's jacob instructed joseph but the sons are all involved here we won't get, we won't deal with that his sons carried it to land buried in machpelah and then this the post the the, the coda to the joseph story <clears throat> After burying his father, Joseph returned to Egypt and his brothers and all who gone. Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, which he's already been dead. They said, what if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrong that we did him? So they sent this message. They can't even talk to him directly. They say, and, and you know, we, we don't know if this is true or they're making it up. Before his death, your father left us instruction. So should you say to Joseph, forgive, I urge you. So they themselves sense the, the tremendous lack of, <coughs> of, of trust between him and Joseph, them and Joseph. And they, I'm saying they invent this story that Jacob told them to, to ask for forgiveness. Joseph was in tears. Again, it's ambiguous as to what those tears mean. Is it, are these tears of, oh, so lovely? Or it's, are they tears of, oh my God, they, you know, even now they're lying to me. Okay, mm -hmm. exasperation. His brothers went to him themselves, flung themselves before him. We are prepared to be slaves. The ironic statement of the of the century, because in the very next chapter in the Torah, they will be slaves, that is their descendants. Joseph said, am I a substitute for God? And I, he clearly has been. Besides, although you intended me harm, God intended it for good. So here we have... The, the framing that Joseph has done, but, 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 as we will see in the very next verse, I think that this Joseph, Joseph has buried himself in a pit that he can't get out of. Because by bringing his family down, by making them dependent upon him, by giving them a place to live, by making them completely dependent upon him for food, shelter, et cetera, et cetera. He, and, and by not having complete and total freedom for Pharaoh, with Pharaoh, he himself has been enslaved. I call Joseph the first slave. And that is what I'm reading between the lines of verse 20 and verse 21. I will sustain you with your children. Thus he reassured them speaking to them, Verse 22, I meant. So Joseph and his father's house remained in Egypt. Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph lived to see children of the third generation, Ephraim. The children of Machir, son of Manasseh, were likewise born to him uh, and at Joseph's knees. So now, verse 24. Joseph says to his brothers, I am going to die. Elohim, God, he will remember you. And he will take you from this land to the land that he promised to Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. Notice that he doesn't mention the name of this land. Then he says as follows, Yosef, swears, at B'nai Yisrael more. Pakod Yifkod Elohim etchem valitem et atzmotai mizeh. I swear uh, to you, God will surely remember you, and you will bring my bones up from this. Now I bold it up here, mizeh, because I see in this a very stark contrast between the way Joseph refers to the land and where Jacob referred to the land. Jacob said the land of Egypt. And when Joseph made the appeal before Pharaoh, he says, 
that Jacob wants to go to Canaan. But when Joseph says to his brothers in the private intimacy of their own oath, take me up, he says, you will take me up from this, mizeh. That to me is very, very significant. Vayamat Yosef ben Me'av ve'aser shanim ve'achantu oto, de'embamam ve'yisem baron be'misrayim, they put him in the coffin. So I am making a big case on mizeh. Because Zeh, and, and here I'm going to just stop the share for a second because I'll, I'll, I'll have some proof text. The word Zeh has multiple layers of meaning, one of which is contempt. Zeh. Zeh. That one. Zeh. Right? It's, zeh is the way you speak about someone indirectly without having to name them. Or Zeh is something that you make reference to, it's this, as in this predicament, this mess, this situation, this whole, this whole being. And what is that being? Mize is, to me, it is the, the entirety of the whole situation. Ze is exile. Ze is the conflict. Ze is the fact that I am subservient and you are subservient and that you have no power and go on and on and on down. And I just want to give you an example. I think that to me, this is the best example of ze as contempt. And I could give you lots of examples through Breshid and Shmot, but this example uh, comes from the book of Esther where uh, um, ze as contempt in this great scene where, where Esther outs Haman as the, as the despicable Haman. The king and Haman came to feast with Queen Esther. And the second day, the king asked Esther, what is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted to you. And what is your request? Even half the kingdom, it shall be granted. Queen Esther replied, if your majesty will do me the favor, and if it pleases your majesty, let, me, let my life be granted as my wish, and my people as my request. For we have been sold by people and I to be destroyed, massacred, and exterminated. Had we only been sold as bondmen and bondmen, why have been, I would have kept silent for the adversary is not worthy of the king's trouble. Thereupon the king Achashverus demanded of Queen Esther, me, who, ze, ve, a, ze, who, contemptive language, who is that? Which one is that? Asher melao libo la sotkein, who had dared to do this? And then she says, batomer se, ish tsar voyev, this terrible, despicable Haman Harahazeh. That guy. That one. That awful, despicable dot, dot, dot. <laughs> and then Haman Nivat, Haman cringed, and so the king and the Shuri left the wine feast of the palace garden. Haman remained to plead with the queen for his life, for he saw the king was resolved to destroy him. When the king returned to the place that Haman was lying prostrate on the couch, and then, does he mean, cried the king, to ravish the queen in my own palace? No sooner did these words leave the king's lips than Haman's face was covered. In other words, Haman is the arch contemptible person in the entire Bible. And he is referred to as Hazeh. And my, my case is, and, and I'm saying it's my case because I look very far and wide to see if there were any comments on, you know, take me up from this. And no, nobody seems to comment on this that I saw. So I'm claiming the copyright here, which is that when Joseph says, take me up out of here, he is saying it with contempt. He's saying it with contempt towards Egypt. He's saying it with contempt for Egypt because he understands that he has to leave there. And, and, there are you know, parallel midrashim that say that, in fact, the brothers also wanted to have their bones taken out of Egypt. Well, this idea is a, actually a very ancient idea. It has a parallel Egyptian sources in a story called the story of Sinuhe. Sinuhe is an Egyptian official who leaves the land of Egypt, but, but insists that he, when he dies, be buried back in Egypt. And this idea of being buried in your native land, of course, is an idea that still 
captures the Jewish imagination to this very day. But uh, in, in the early Zionist period and in the early state of Israel period, it absolutely commanded the imagination of people. And here I want to show you a couple of things that I think you will find fascinating. And they are as follows. This is a silent, this unfortunately doesn't have the uh, uh, sound, but, but uh, for, for a couple of minutes you'll watch this. This is the reinterment ceremony of Herzl. Herzl coming back to, in 1949, uh, one of the first acts that the, uh, the, the fledgling state of Israel did was to reinter Herzl's remains in the land of Israel in, in Jerusalem. It was a debate as to where they would bury him. This is Herzl's coffin coming on a Jeep, okay? I can't make out the writing on it, but the seven stars here is part of the Judenstadt, his, his uh, emblem. He saw, he wrote in the Judenstadt that the flag of the Jewish state should have seven stars for the seven hour workday, which is fascinating. This is Mount Herzl, or no, I'm sorry, this is the, the Jewish agency building, still exists today. And actually, no, I'm sorry, this is, this, is, this is the Jewish Agency building. Those of you who recognize on King George Street, fascinating, you know, the courtyard right in front of there. there mm -hmm. He's laying in state there. I don't know how long he laid in state, okay? And the people, Jerusalem, you could see the, our, our hotel, the, 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 the uh, plaza is right across the street from here, okay? They're walking by. And they're watching, they're, wa they're, they're, they're paying respects and look at the way that they pay respects. They don't really, you know, not, not too orderly, which is fascinating. And now we have the movement to Har Herzl, okay? They set up a big canopy on Har Herzl, a big military uh, pageant. There he is on the catap, whatever it's called, the sale of the state of Israel, the flag and honor guards. 1949, this is August 1949. And you can't make out too many people here. Young people, old people, I don't see where Ben Gurion is uh, in the whole thing. Then this is, obviously they're singing probably a tikva. This looks like the chief rabbi of the Navy. And over here, it looks like there are two other important rabbinical figures and family figures or others. Herzl didn't really have much family. They were all gone at this point. And, and I watched this. I couldn't, I couldn't find Ben-Gurion in this. Maybe that was Ben-Gurion there. I'm sure Weitzman was here. And this is the cantor, probably reading the Amal Rachamim at this point. probably flanked by the chief rabbi of the, of the Navy. And out of the site was the, the, the chief rabbi of the army or the, the, the other chief rabbi. And these are the, obviously the, the heads of Israel, the military. Or an honor guard. Okay, and that's that. Okay. And um, I, that's a fascinating little clip of reinterment of, of uh, what 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 took place? Uh, sorry. Where did it go? I'll get it back in a second. There there were other important moments uh, of uh, uh, of. Um, Okay. 
Just a second. Here we go. This is uh, Jabotinsky. Jabotinsky was also reinterred. And here, I'm gonna just do this for our sake here. Here we can see Lieutenant Colonel John Henry Patterson. Okay. The exhibition. Hang on. All across flags becomes Jewish army. Jabotinsky died in New York in 1940, but his bones were buried in Israel just in uh, 1964. Why? Because Ben Gurion didn't allow to bring his boss to Israel just after Ben Gurion resigned from the Prime Minister as a Prime Minister in 1963. Levi Eshkol allowed to bring Israel the boss of Jabotinsky and his wife. Adoni Rosh Beitar, Avino, Moreno, Verabeno, Shafta, Neretz, Avotecha, Uvanecha. Okay, that last little moment, there was Begin speaking about Jabotinsky. And, and, and again, you know, I bring these clips here because what's tied into the whole idea of reinterment is in fact <clears throat> quite political. The, 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 the debate about reinterring Jabotinsky was a very, very uh, fiery debate in the same era as the time of reinterring uh, Herzl. Jabotinsky and Herzl were rival, you know, um, ideolo ideologues. Of course, Herzl was way before Jabotinsky, but, but Jabotinsky as the revision and, and Ben-Gurion, you know, they loathe Jabotinsky, although there is some correspondence of, of mutual respect. And Jabotinsky, I'm sorry, Ben-Gurion loathed Begin, although you know, pre and after 67, they, they had some kind of rapprochement. There were some respectful words that were written between the two of them. Um, and, and it wasn't until, as the clip said, it wasn't until uh, uh, Ben-Gurion was out of office that Levi Eshkol, who, who, who was, a, I guess, a mensch, right? Would you say that Levi Eshkol was, was more of a mensch? He understood that a significant part of the population held the beliefs of Jabotinsky and that it was important symbolically to have him brought back to Israel with his wife. You saw two coffins there. It was Jabotinsky and his wife and they were, they were reinterred also on, on, on Har Herzl. And when you go up to Har Herzl, you can see their graves there as well. So the whole notion of reinterment in the land of Israel itself plays a very, very important and symbolic role. Let's, uh, uh, Take another look at, um, hang on, just a second. <clears throat> Last, I want to, oh yeah. So this is, this is a very interesting little document to see. And it follows, you know, in the tradition of, uh, uh, of the Josephs. This is Tzavato Shel Jabotinsky, the last will of Jabotinsky. We don't have to go through the first four paragraphs, but I'm going to just bring up the, the last one. Ritzoni Sheik Beruni, O Yisrefu et Gufati, meaning it is my wish that they will, you will bury, they will bury me, or they will cremate my body. Achat Ili, what does that mean? I don't care. I don't care. Bo b'makom sheim tzaini hamavet, wherever I die. Ve'et atzmotai, my bones, b'mikreh she'ekaver mechutz l'eretz Yisrael, in the instance that I am outside of Israel when I die, buried outside, ein l'havir l'eretz Yisrael, you should not bring to Israel only by order of the Jewish government shall Eretz Zoki Takum, when this government should arise. Jabotinsky died in 1940. He died in upstate New York at a, at a summer camp. 
uh, a Zionist summer camp was buried, I believe around there. I forget the exact place. I, you know, I, I've driven by it a number of times. I always mean to kind of pop in and see, see what's going on there. And, um, but, but this is in the long tradition from Joseph, right? He wants to be buried. And, and it's not that he had contempt for the United States. On the contrary, he respected, of course, the United States. But he was buried. He was buried in exile. It was exile he had contempt for, and so by saying "bury me in Israel," he's saying, "I am a leader. I am a national leader. I belong in Israel." And when there is a government, a Jewish government in the land, which there will be, he didn't know this in nineteen. You know, in, you know it wasn't there in nineteen forty. Died during the war. He said, "I want you to promise that you will bring my bones to uh, Israel." Okay. And uh, with that, we get uh, another. So we have um, uh, the cabinet approving it. Uh, I'm just going to show you a couple of other things here. Uh, there's a fellow who did a, a, has a whole book on this subject, as there always is. This is Alan Herzl today. This is uh, Barack Obama visiting our Herzl. Um, and um, this is the, the Doron Bar is the name of the author who wrote a book on this. I was going to buy it, except it's seventy eight dollars on Kindle. It wasn't worth it. So the, <laughs> just the article in the Times of Israel on this. They use the highest mountain in Jerusalem, and it is symbolic, said Bar, pointing to the view still mostly visible from the flat square grave site. He could see all of the city's residents, and they could see him. And this is the the plateau of Har Herzl. As many of you, of course, have been there, and it is with uh, different uh, stadia that that are around it. Okay, um, and uh, just a second. Uh, right. Okay, um, and the bird's eye view of Theodor Herzl's grave on this um, Herzl's body in 1949 was flown. Da da da. And today, four of the country's leaders are buried there. Levi Eshkol, Golda Meir, Yitzhak Shamir, Yitzhak Rabin. Any of you who have been up there have seen that. Leir Rabin is buried alongside them. And Zalman Shalar, Chaim Kretzel, Yosef Sprinzak, Eliezer Kaplan. So on our trips, we, we, we go there and we always see these uh, various graves. Okay. Once the WZO leaders were included in the hillside, the decision about their other Zionist leaders became more convoluted. Right-wing Zionist leader Jeff Chinsky died suddenly in the year 40, was buried in Long Island. But his will stated that he wanted to be buried in Zion once there was a Jewish government in place. Of course, Ben Gurion didn't want him. The two Zionist leaders had always been rivals. We talked about that. Zen Levieshko, and then others who uh, were are buried elsewhere. And then there is also the Hanasenish grave, the paratrooper fell. And this is a beautiful uh, little photo of the, the coffin of Hanasenish being brought from Budapest. Uh, and she, she also, as a national heroic symbol, buried in, uh, in Israel, uh, in Jerusalem. Um, so you have, you have other, other, other uh, important figures being buried there. But I want to do one more thing with us while we are on the subject of uh, this beautiful, morose subject of death and burial. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, two seconds here. Sorry. Uh, this is the author of that book. This week we are celebrating commemorating a very special event in the history of the land of Israel. 70 years ago, the remains of Benjamin Zev Herzl, Theodor Herzl, were brought from the city of Vienna, and he was buried in Jerusalem in the highest peak of the city. I wrote a book about this, uh, this phenomenon. This is Baran. I'm just going to skip to the last Even, minute. Uh, Jerusalem. It was only after the establishment of the of the state, only after 1948 and the end of the War of Independence, that it was decided that Jerusalem would be the right place to bury him. The reason was that Western Jerusalem was declared as the capital city of the state of Israel. 
uh, a special mountain was chosen for that, the highest peak in Western Jerusalem. And then a plane, an El Al plane, went to Vienna and brought back the remains of Herzl. The coffin was taken first to Tel Aviv, and the day after, on the 17th of August, 1949, um, the, the coffin was brought to Jerusalem and lowered to, to the ground uh, to what will be later named Mount Herzl. The place was developed during the 50s as the most important national site in Israel, a place where the, uh, on the eve of the Independence Day, the independence of Israel is celebrated each year. Okay, so that, you know, we, we know that. Now I want to do this. Watch this. Can you all see? Okay. That's, that's an interesting little thing. And here is a website that is devoted to burial in Israel. All of the different kinds of things that, that happen. You can go into a kibbutz, you need an application, all these different cemeteries, etc. And on and on and on it goes. And, and, and it is not cheap, okay? And I brought that in to, to, to demonstrate the following, which is, you know, this, I, I can't keep thinking about the word mise, mise, right? Which is what Joseph said. And, and the, the idea of, it's, it's not only I want to, I mean, of course there are messianic, you know, notions you know, related to Barry in Israel, you're there for Tchiat team, you know, I mean, the, 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 the idea is that when the Messiah comes, you know, we will have the, we'll all experience the, the bodily resurrection of the dead. And uh, those people who are buried in the Mount of Olives will be first, okay? So, so my reaction to that is if, if God is gonna restore the, uh, our, us to our bodies, it, it's probably not gonna be that difficult for him to fly us over to Israel either. Right? You know, it, it's like about so so the point is that that you know you know to the the proximity of burial to the temple obviously you know, has has rich significance and the the idea of being buried in Israel has significance in in as much as you you feel that even your earthly remains have no value to them outside of the land Bob you want to say something go ahead Three things. The first thing I say, it's no coincidence that Mizer rhymes with Feh, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that'll be always together with that. The, uh, I'm wondering if you could comment first, the comment of bones and the second on oaths. And the focus on bones in the text there, the whiteness, is it true that I read someplace that the righteous the souls, the righteousness is engraved in people's bones as one belief? in certain mystical traditions? That's the first question. Why the focus on bones rather than other parts of the body? Yeah, well, bones are what remains. And, and, um, but bo it probably, it's probably much more than that. It has to do with burial traditions that uh, go back to antiquity. You know, we, we, we tend to think that our way of burying is the way that Jews have been doing it for thousands and thousands of years. That's not true. Uh, there's, there's ample evidence archaeologically that what Jews did was they buried people into um, uh, little 
Okay. Ossuaries. Ossuaries and cubicles. And until the body then decomposed, they put, they put the bone in ossuaries. The ossuary is a tiny, a smaller container uh, which, which contained the bones. And that's what, what was, was in the end reinterred. And you have archaeological um, sites that, that, that really show that. And you can see ossuaries at the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. That's bones. Your second point. The second is about in this part of the Parsha, there's a lot of discussion about oaths and swearing more so than others. And I'm wondering if there's commentary about when are oaths this way or that way. I remember reading something that before Joseph became king, he had to ascend stairs for each language that you spoke. And there's some, I don't know if it's a Midrashic comment that when he got up to uh, 70, or something that was the number of languages spoken but he didn't say that he spoke the hebrew language at the time because that would put him above pharaoh so pharaoh made an oath with him that he would not reveal that he knew another language besides his so i'm so not just the, the midrash but but it does sound plausible you know oaths in general are are you know they still remain important in our time but uh, of course they they had um you know they were, they were very, very seriously taken in, in antiquity. Uh, swearing falsely, of course, was a capital offense. And, um, you know, when things needed to be sealed, they were sealed with an oath. You know, today we, we still, you know, swear, as we said, to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, you know, because at the end of the day, you know, our system works on, uh, on the whole presumption that you are you are as good as your word is and 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 you can be punished you know uh by law for lying for uh contempt etc by contempt of your oath yes right you got a third point then Alana, Alana go ahead Alana. about the word they yeah uh i think it really shows uh how you how your staff feels about me time absolutely in a way and also uh he is forgiving his brothers he's making it uh clear to them that he uh will not punish them he will be good to them and uh, support them but he in a little bit of a part he wants them to know that he would rather not have gone through all this procedure to become the second of the king in this, the, in Zot Haaret, this land, he probably would rather not have gone uh, through what they did to him. So- I think, I think you're absolutely right. I think, I think the words, uh, and, and I, I, you know, I tried going through the whole story and, and looking at the different places where the word appears. And, and uh, the case that I would make is as follows that what he is rejecting he's rejecting everything that it is about the whole story and all of the 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 i want to say the mess the the awfulness the you know he says ze pitrono when it, you know this is the when he when he when he when he's in jail with the butler and the baker he you know, and they tell him their dreams. He says, Ze Pitrono, and he's filled with confidence. And he doesn't use that language with Pharaoh when he explains Pharaoh's dreams. But um, he, you know, there is, um, I think, not a small amount of the feeling that, that he has gotten himself into a bind and he can't get out of there. And to me, that's the, you know, the interpretation, one of the interpretations that, are, that is plausible you know, his brothers put him in a pit. Potiphar's wife put him in jail. But he got himself to elevated to power and he entrapped himself in all the trappings of the power and he can't get himself out. And at the end of the story, he is buried in a coffin in a pit in Egypt. And he is powerless he can't do anything about that and he therefore must rely on others to help him 
And to me, that's the, the tragic end of the story. It's not a happy story. The tragic end of the story is that the, the one who thought he was most powerful in the end was the biggest slave. He had the least power, the least freedom. He could not say to them, get me out of Egypt now. He could not even say upon his death, you know, do what you did to Jacob, take me out and make a whole procession. Would never have happened. Pharaoh would have never let him let them do that. And and you get the premonition in that last verse that things are going to change. In fact, they change, you know, within six verses of the next chapter, because there arises a Pharaoh who does not know Joseph, and then starts all the policies against uh, the Israelites there. Go ahead, Mike. So I have a question about Goren Atid. Goren Atid. It, it, it seems like a very random uh, location for them to stop and the, between Mitzrayim and going to Hebron. It seems very out of the way, at least from a geographical perspective, because it's being described as Me'ever la Yarden. Which it's on the other side of the Jordan, right. It's on the, the east side of the Jordan River. So you would think that the, the entourage traveling from Mitzrayim going north would travel uh, more along the Mediterranean to get a more direct route to Hebron. So, so this we have to look at, you know, in, in, in terms of the map, maybe they went through the, our, the, the lower part there from uh, the, the, you know, the, the Red Sea up the valley. Uh, I have to take a look at a map and see exactly where, where it is. But, but the, the sense of the text is that this is a massive demonstration. This is a demonstration of both the Egyptian grief and also political demonstration against the Canaanites. Don't forget, the rivals of the Egyptians are not the Canaanites. The Canaanites, they could care less about. It, they, it was the, the Babylonians that they cared about. <laughs> and, and they had to demonstrate to the Babylonians that, that they're, they're a power. And the only, the people that are in between, the Canaanites, they have to, they have to you know, go one way or the other. Steve, yeah. what is it? Well, the sea peoples, the Philistines or the pre-Philistines were along the coast. Indeed. And they were powerful and uh, they were constantly at war with Egypt. So there you go. Egyptians didn't want to go that way. Okay, good. I accept that one. Ellie. Reading about Joseph the last couple of weeks, and I have a feeling that he was a very unhappy man. There was really no time of personal fulfillment in his life. The the when he had a, a, a way of saying something in last week's Parsha, he brought the whole family down and he settled them in Goshen. And it was a terrible mistake. I mean, he did awful, awful things by being so overly good to them. He gave them such power and he put them in a, in a place within this country where they could never be accepted, would always be separate, would always be unequal. It was just doomed to failure from the get-go. So, Is there any time in this saga that he that you would consider him a happy man? No. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I agree with you. You know, he 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 had everything done against it. I, I you know what he he is happy when he gets out of jail in Egypt. I think I think that that is happy for him, and I think he he's you know always trying to wrestle with things. But there, you know, he's like his father. His father, you know, I think Jacob, you know, by the end of his life, Jacob is quite a depressed man also. Yeah. yeah. And and broken by by life. Even when, you know, you could say, look, Jacob, you know, you see you, you, Pharaoh asks you how old you are, you could say, uh, you know, I'm 130 years old. You know, that that's an accomplishment. I have a family, grandchildren, great grandchildren. <laughs> look at look at this. I'm so grateful for my life. No, <laughs> you know. Joseph, Joseph is a, 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 a not an apple not far from the tree. Bob. Yeah, for me, I don't find the ending as tragic as you're describing it. Okay. I mean, complexity is there, but I find it to be a bit bittersweet more than anything else. There's some reconciliation. There's the fact that Jacob says, take my bones up there. And he says, I will do so. But he also is not talking just about Jacob, but he's also doing for himself, making an oath that he's going to do the same thing. And in fact, he stops dreaming and starts focusing on the world at large and, and making things happen. So I find it bittersweet more than tragic. Okay. Ed, we, we, need, we need to come back to this in 20 years and see 
how you feel about it. <laughs> All right. Any other That's comments? True. Go ahead, Marlene. Doesn't he also have the positive hope that since his father had said they would be out of there at some time, there's this hopefulness. There's always hope. <clears throat> well, the text doesn't show us that. The we we're, to we're, we're, we're doing that because we, we basically are hoping for better things, for, for a solution to the problems that we're going through. And hope is really part and parcel of, of who we are. But I don't see any, any factual evidence in the text that tells me that there was hope there. Well, I, I, I want to say that, um, you know, th there, there is this promise, this promise that, that, that God will remember them and take you out of here. Right. Oh. And that, that is part of the bind that they're in. They, they are, they, because they, they could easily go back to Egypt, They'll go back to Canaan, but they've been told to wait mm -hmm. and being told to wait sets in motion a, a series of calamities mm -hmm. and and you know the 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 torah the story of the torah is constructed that god will redeem them god will liberate them that god becomes god to them based on the exodus right you know i we all want to rewrite the bible in our own image okay? we all want to say we all want like i want the brothers to have made i don't want them to put him in Egypt. i want joseph as soon as he's in Egypt to call home, I want the brother, I want him not to be cruel to them. I want, I want a lot of things to happen in ways that, that the Bible doesn't have. I, I would love them to go back now because that's where they belong. They belong in Canaan. But the, the Torah, you know, creates the story for us that in order to go back, they have to, they have to experience this enslavement. Why do they have to experience this enslavement? Because God has one objective, which is freedom, to, to give them freedom. And the, the, the lesson of freedom is the lesson that the people of Israel has to impart to the world. And without their direct experience of that, there's no way of imparting that that is the godly message. So it comes at a huge price, but, but it's, what, it's what happens. Go ahead, Marlene. But, but don't you have to have both sides in order to understand one? If all you ever see is red, you wouldn't know what blue is. I, I think, I mean, you know, that, that, that's just the truth, isn't it? The truth is, you know, we all, want, we all want our lives to be good, painless, without suffering, without, you know, difficulty and challenge. But then, you know, what kind of life is it without challenge? What kind of life is it without a little bit of suffering? You know, you don't love without that. Bob. I would just say to quote uh, blessed memory, Rabbi Hilsenrath, for me, it's neither, me, it just was neither an optimist nor a pessimist, but a possibilist. Okay. I like that. <laughs> That's, fair enough. That's fair enough, you know, in the sense that, that there is the possible. You know, I, I take a, I take a, a a a, um, a harsh view of him because because he is the indispensable figure that presents himself as the as a as a salvational figure when in fact he um, he, he is about their downfall and and therefore he is a he is a political warning right beware of people who are salvational figures because they could end up being agents of your downfall and and. I think that the, the Torah is being very, very uh, sophisticated in, in conveying that message to us. Go ahead, Alana. We did not discuss the blessings that uh, each uh, son and or tribe later on received, yeah. but at the very last minute of his life, uh, Jacob makes the same mistake favoring two grandchildren over others, uh, Ephraim and Menashe, making them like their his own sons. So is he still feeling very guilty about what was done to Yosef? Uh, why is he doing it? 
He's doing it because he needs to get to a people. And, and he knows that Joseph is uh, not going to be a tribe on his own. He, know, he wants to establish the double portion for them. And, and by doing so, he injects uh, a, 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 a almost insurmountable level of tension within the fraternal federation. Um, you know, later on, of course, uh, Levy um, is, it doesn't have a tribal territory. Um, so it's, there's the, the, the number of sons is 12. 12 is the important number for, for the unit, 12 being the number of months in the zodiac, etc. There's, there's a lot of symbolism in that month. What happens is um, you, you eliminate uh, uh, Joseph and you eliminate Levi, you have to replace them with two. And that's what that's what's happening now. Does he? He doesn't know that Levy is going to be uh, in that role, um, but uh, he he does prepare the people for that uh, eventuality. It's not a, and and I suppose you know I, I didn't really give a lot of thought to this, but but you know there's something about Joseph because of his Egyptian life that renders him almost um, pasul, you know, for, for incapable of being a tribe at this point. So therefore he's got to redeem the, the other two sons. He could have chosen other of his own sons, other grandchildren. Right. But again, again, maybe it made his own children jealous of the other grandchildren didn't like it. So it just keeps going. It does keep going, and it and it does play itself out later on in the history of biblical Israel because the Mo, the Yosef tribes, the Ephraim and Manasseh, are the essentially the 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 federation of the northern tribes, and and they will have their rivalry with Judah and Benjamin. All right, we have to leave it there. Such a chazak chazak medi chazak. What a great joy it's been to study Breshit, and we will continue next week, beginning. Sefer Shmot with Parsha Shmot. Look forward to seeing you all.